you need to be different. And different is the hardest thing to be. You, you have to answer this sentence, Evan. You have to be able to say, there is no book about X. So I am writing a book about X. Okay. We're talking about selling a million books. You can't just be like, everyone loves it. Right. Like it's too big and big. I think that if you go to a bookstore and you walk around and you have a unique idea in your brain or you have a vision for what you want, it actually is pretty likely that you won't find a similar book. I'm not saying go to the bookstore, find a gap and write to that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying do the inner work first. Start your blog first. Start your YouTube channel first. Hone your voice first. Find your fans first. Then look for the positioning and where it can go that not, no one's doing. Welcome back to our 10 part series on how to sell a million plus books with Neil Pasricha. Today, episode four, we're talking about finding an empty ocean. Mm -hmm. What do you got, man? Well, this one's about being different, okay. being disruptive, finding an empty ocean or an empty place in the bookstore that no book like yours exists yet. Okay. Okay, so there's a process to do this. Uh, you have to be thoughtful about it. And so I think the first thing you gotta do is, uh, you gotta look for a really, really, really big bookstore. If you're in New York, go to The Strand. If you're in Portland, go to Powell's. If you're in Austin, go to, uh, uh, is it Book City down there? Forgetting the name of the bookstore. Book People, got it, finally. If you're in Miami, go to Books and Books. If you're in Toronto, go to the, go to the Big Indigo, or the world's biggest bookstore, BMV, right? Where we're in Toronto. Anyway, find the biggest bookstore near you. Go there and invest in two hours of wandering that store looking for the three most similar books to the one you have either in your mind or that you've been writing online or whatever. Find them, pick them up and hold them and study them for three things. Number one, read the acknowledgements of that book. It's very important that you find the name of the literary agent because that's the person that literally sold the book mm. to editors to buy it. Okay. So um, I stole this advice from David Sedaris, who sold many millions of books. He's a comedy writer, humorist, and I asked him way back in the day when I lined up for him uh, to get his autograph like 10 years ago, how do you find a literary agent? He said, find the book similar to yours and read the acknowledgements. Then you find people who literally are doing that. Cool. You can Google them, their names and addresses and emails, are public, you approach them and say, I got one somewhere. That's, that's the first thing. Second thing you find out from them is, where's the ocean? Where's the gap? Where's the piece of the book market that does not have what you're writing? Or are you adding to the, like, is there too many books on this topic already? Because mm -hmm. you don't want that. If you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write a children's book about hitting. And then you go and there's like 50 children's books about hitting. You're like, well, now I'm going to be the 51st. Right. What you want is to go to the biggest bookstore and discover that there's no children's books about hitting. And so you can write that one. So you're looking for an ocean or a gap or some space, right, that around your idea, hmm. right? And then what you do, this is the interesting thing, is that you, you write down the Dewey Decimal Number okay. from those three books and you go to the library. I know this sounds funny but bookstores are organized by category. Hmm. Libraries are organized by the Dewey Decimal System, right? So Melvin Dewey was like this guy 150 years ago. He made up like a periodic table type thing for books, right? You know, 300s is psychology, 500s is sciences, 700s is management, you know, this is fiction, whatever. Because the library is organized by Dewey Decimal System, you can look up the Dewey Decimal number from the three books that you have already picked out and find all the books in those categories. Again, you're looking for an empty ocean or an empty place to play. What you want is to find very few or zero books similar to the one that you're writing or have written or have in your head. Okay. Why is this important? Because you need in this crazy, overwhelmingly cluttered world of content that we all live in today, with endless books on any topic, endless YouTube channels on any topic, endless podcasts on any topic, you need to be different. 
and different is the hardest thing to be. Okay, so what I'm talking about here is then therefore deciding, oh, you, you have to answer this sentence, Evan. You have to be able to say, there is no book about X. So I am writing a book about X, Okay. right? There is no book about um, how to raise autistic children as a single stay-at-home dad. So I'm writing a book about how to raise autistic children as a single stay-at-home dad. Okay. If your book is hitting the mark on a topic that people want, but nobody's reading, nobody has yet, boom, you found an empty ocean. So how did you do with this one? I mean, this is coming out. Huh? What's the process for so your on this, so, so yeah, so let's, let's, let's go backwards here. Um, this book came first, okay? The Book of Awesome, 2010. Um, there is no book like it. There is no book. The only book that I could find that was like it is a book called 14,001 Things to Be Happy About hmm. by Barbara Ann Kipfer. The other reason it's good to find those books that are similar is because they can blurb your book. So inside this book is a quote from Barbara Ann Kipfer saying, this gives me 14,001 things to be happy about, the book of awesome. So it's like great to grab a blurb that's similar. But there was literally no other book that was just a list of positive, simple pleasures with an essay about them. Hmm. Her book is different because there's no write-up. It's just 14,000 things. Cold pillows, wet suitcase, you know, whatever it is. Mine is like a, a commentary on it, okay? And I noticed her book, by the way, had a million copies sold on the front. So I was like, oh, there's no book similar to this, but the one that's closest has also done well. Right. So I was like, cool, there's something there. For You Are Awesome, um, first I identified a problem that I had, which is uh, resilience and anxiety. I noticed that as I have children, I have children, um, and they have, have, are starting to get little anxiety. I'm like, who else's kids have anxiety? And I talk to every parent, and they're like, all of our kids do. They're all nervous and stressed, and the world these days is so overwhelming and complicated that kids these days are anxious, and we're feeling anxious about our kids' anxiety. Hmm. The interesting thing that I noticed was nobody is dealing with largely war, famine, uh, starvation, like major depression, like major like economic depression. Like we got, we're living in the most abundant time ever in human civilization, and yet we have the highest ever anxiety rates. So I wrote this book as a way to address things like anxiety and mental illness for inside myself and hopefully for other people. And I could not find a book that was doing that in an accessible, simple way, giving people a model for resilience that wasn't based on deep academic research, hmm. although that's backing up everything I'm saying, but rather on simple little tools, guidelines, and frameworks that anybody could do in order to get through your day a little bit easier. So one of the things, for example, is I talk about this way to like, clear your anxieties in the morning by doing this two minute practice, right. right? Which I referred to already, but that's just an example of one of the things from the book. So I can't help but think in, in our previous video, you were talking about how there's a million books that are put out every year, half yeah. a million from the big publishers, half yeah. a million from self-publishing self -publishing. every year. That's probably right? even conservative considering that self-publishing is so easy now, so easy and so right. huge, right? So there's a million books a year already coming out. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, the default thinking is easy to say, well, how am I going to be unique when there's a million coming yeah. every year? Yeah. And then the first example <laughs> of talking about, well, uh, you know, single dad who has an autistic child yeah. feels like such a niche thing that then how do I sell a million books with a oh. tiny little niche topic? Yeah. So, so how, do I, how do I bridge that gap of being unique uh -huh. And there's so many books that are being sold, but also being wide enough that I can have some significant sales from my book. Well, it's so, so it's interesting you say that because um, uh, I have so many examples I brought with me to kind of use as examples. But um, if you can pinpoint a niche on the head, mm -hmm. you can nail it. The market can actually be gigantic. Sounds small, right? Sounds small. Uh, autistic single father, okay? But there's probably millions of people in that same boat around the world or that are growing into that industry or growing into that, that, that lifestyle that, that need that and they don't know they need that. Mm. And in the process of writing it, yeah, and by the way, I'm, I'm we're talking about selling a million books, but I'm not, you can't just aim for the, it can't just be like, everyone loves it. Right. Like it's too big and vague. I think that if you go to a bookstore and you walk around and you have a unique idea in your brain or you have a vision for what you want, it actually is pretty likely that you won't find a similar book. I think it's actually pretty likely because um, the bookstore is curating for you what's popular or what's selling. That's why I didn't say go to Amazon, right? Because they have everything, 
I'm like saying go to a big bookstore, then go to an airport bookstore, then go to an independent bookstore. An independent's a great way to go because then you see like what is popular enough that it stood the test of time and it's being sold in a book that only, a bookstore only has like 500 books in it, right? So then you find gaps that are in the mass space that you can write to. But your point is valid. Like I'm like, I don't know the perfect answer. I just think that if you can nail an, an, an industry on the head, you then can still go big. This is the world's first ever uh, children's book that is interactive and hyper-realistic. Okay. Meaning that the graphics in here are like you tap the earth, the earth gets bigger, you tap it again, it gets bigger, you zoom into the earth, kids love it, right? Okay. And then you flip, so, so there's never been a children's book that's interactive and realistic. I partner with an animation studio that works with the Discovery Channel to make this thing. Okay. Okay, so. It sold really well. Yeah. And it wasn't that unique, but there was nothing specifically just like this when it came out. So if you There was lots of interactive books. Right. Lots of realistic books. I just did something that no one else had done before. So do you walk to the kids section then yeah. of the bookstore? Yeah. And you look at So inspirations for this were like um, uh, the very hungry caterpillar. It's an interactive book. You got the holes in it and stuff like that. Okay. Press here. You know that book where you, I don't know if you read this series, I don't know, where you press the yellow dot and like the dots split up, okay. tap the magic tree. I'm like, oh, I love those interactive books where you pretend to play with it, okay. but I want one that's like you're zooming into outer space, you blow on the waves, okay. the waves get bigger, okay. you, you know, then you flip it over your head, you're underwater, okay. you're right? Like, so I wanted something that was a little bit more like a guided meditation. And so when I did press for this book, and people said on TV shows, what is this book? I said, it's an introduction to guided meditation for children. It's interesting. Yeah, because there was no book that I could think of that was that way. Yeah. How would it work for fiction? Same thing? Well, fiction, I think, may be even easier because your idea and your voice and your authentic self is, by definition, going to be pretty unique. I think so. I, I don't write fiction, so I'm always stretching when we talk about fiction, although I should be able to answer that because that's what the video is about. But I just think that when you write your story, of course it's your story. You might start by copying and start by imitating voices, but right. as it keeps going, it's even more you. So if I have a sci-fi book in my head of this future it, alien man. civilization, but the problem... <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> I don't, but, but, but if I did, then the process would be go to the bookstore, look yeah. at sci-fi, see what's selling well, bookstore on Amazon. Look for the gap. Selling. Look for right. the empty ocean. I heard Gary Vee also say that in an era where there's endless supply of content, mm -hmm. meaning that everybody's putting content out on every channel in every way, it's overwhelming, mm -hmm. the only chance you have to stick out is by being your truest and most authentic self. So before you go to the bookstore, before you look for empty ocean, decide inside yourself what you want to be writing. Mm. Don't say, oh, there's, I'm not saying go to the bookstore, find a gap and write to that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, do the inner work first. Start your blog first. Start your YouTube channel first. Hone your voice first. Find your fans first. Then look for the positioning and where it can go that not, no one's doing. There's no guided introduction to guided meditation for kids that I could find. There's no list of simple pleasures. There's no simple book on happiness that you can just understand to like figure out how happy. To me. And you're a reader too. So don't forget when you go to the bookstore, the answer isn't, is there one for somebody else? It's, is there a book that I would buy hmm. on this topic? Mm -hmm. And if there isn't, perfect. You're going to write it. What about using Amazon and seeing how the books are selling well or, or how to pick which category that you want your book it's to It's fine to do in. that. The only problem is, and I've heard lots of this advice. People say go on the rankings and, and check where the gaps are. Look at the three-star reviews because yeah. the three-star reviews tell you like what's missing from the books. Okay. The only problem is... Then I, then I worry about, like, are you really writing authentically? Like, are you writing to sell a book that sells? That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write a book that's yours and that's really good. That's why I'm talking voice. That's why I'm talking fans. Then we can talk about the marketing and the sales stuff. But it's got to be your thing. I'm not selling a, writing a book to sell it. I'm not talking about writing a book as a business card here. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about writing an awesome book that you are proud of on your deathbed because you're like, I contributed something to the global conversation and that you can be proud of. So I don't study all these metrics and rankings and look at it that way. I just think of your idea first and then see where it fits. And if it doesn't fit, 
or if you're not, if it's overwhelmingly full, you will have therefore a more difficult climb to find fans, find a literary agent, find a publisher, because every step of the way, people are gonna say like, that's already been done. Hmm. How yeah. much is it if, I, if somebody's trying to get a lit agent, trying to, yeah. try to get a publisher, you come with your idea, guided meditation for kids, yeah. how much of it then needs to be kind of positioned and yeah. managed and tweaked to get the, the deal, to get the sale? It's, and a, then- it's amazing. So it's amazing because um, uh, this book, about a month before it was published, the Book of Awesome, was called The Other Side of the Pillow. Okay. I even have the cover. I can give it to you if you want to post it here. <laughs> and the 199 other awesome things in life. Okay. We had a cover. It was it had a pillow on it. It was orange. Okay. And a few months before publication, the editor said, "That looks like a book about insomnia." Okay. She's like, "It looks like a book that you'd read if you're having trouble sleeping." So we completely changed the title, the framing, the positioning. I'd already written the book. Right. No words changed. But we haven't got to title yet. We're gonna get there. It's okay. gonna be. It's gonna. No, it's not to. Not, <laughs> not to, skipping ahead, guys. Yeah, not 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 to give you like a like a like um, what's that? Spoiler. Yeah. We're gonna get to title. But like, there's an example where the entire title, positioning, cover, completely changed. Right. Just before. And then Austin became. I mean, the brand. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the other thing is that like we haven't got to that yet either. But there's something about ownability. Yet that's something that you can own. Okay. So, so what? That's like number seven in the video series, man. We're not even there yet. Jumping ahead. <laughs> what I'm hearing is you need to you need to figure out your own voice and your own first what you're trying to create. Yes. But then it's got to match it to some kind of positioning. Yeah. You're not just trying to chase the market. You're not just trying to position it in a certain way for people. Because I think that's disingenuous. Right. And I think the the market sniffs that out pretty quick. Right. You're like, oh, you're the seventh book. You're right. You're you're like you know a minestrone right. soup for the golfer soul. You're like right. someone's did that. Right. You know, don't do that. Find your voice right. first, then see where it fits. Right. Maybe it's that, maybe what we're getting to through the conversations, yeah, it's gotta be somewhere in the middle. Of course, there's a commercial element. Or like, like it's 95% be- you, and then that last 5% is just, how do I, w- we'll change the We changed the whole thing right before. But it's the same concept. Same book inside, inside. Right. exactly. But then don't just go make the book of, of amazing because the book of awesome did well. Right? And by the way, anytime you see a hardcover book come out as a paperback with a totally different cover, happens all the time. Okay. What you're hearing the publisher say is we messed up. Huh. What you're hearing the publisher say is we got it wrong. Let's try something totally different for the paperback. Hmm. If, it, the, if the hardcover sold well, they wouldn't change the cover. Right. But so often when you see a paperback, you're like, what? Oh, this is the same book, but a totally different cover. What they're confessing to is that they got the ocean wrong. They guessed wrong on where it goes. Hmm. So now they're trying to position it totally differently. And that's a dance you play between you and the publisher and the lit agent to figure out. And the out publisher's trying to guess the market. And, right. and if there's proof of concept, that's, that's healthier. You can How say, do you balance that, like, this is what I want to create? Yeah. Especially for first time authors. Yeah. This is what I want to create versus here are the experts who know what they want to do. Like, I want my little thing on the inside flap and I want pictures and they don't want. So, how do you know where that you need to fight for versus, okay, these guys are experts? So, I always got worried about this question because according to my book deals, it's like the publisher gets last right of refusal. So one answer to your question is in the contracting phase of a book deal, you can say, no, I get to decide the final title or I get to, but very few publishers will do that. that. They they typically will not sign that. But they also aren't going to like stampede over your face. Right. They want you to sell it. With you crying and screaming, right? Yeah. So I got great advice from Seth Godin. Famous marketing author, he's written 19 books like Purple Cow, Lynchpin, Tribes. And he said, Neil, whose name is on the cover? At the end of the day, it's your name. So you have to fight for everything you're not gonna be proud of. I'll be honest with you. Hmm. I pushed back on the cover of this book, even after the title was changed, probably 10 times till we got this one. Hmm. I'm so glad we did, because it's a winner. Hmm. I pushed back on this title and cover about nine times. I don't like the cover. Hmm. I don't like the smiley face. Okay. I said, I don't want a smiley face on my cover. Smiley face, come on. They're like, Neil, we've shown you nine covers. Now we're overruling you. Huh. And I still look at that and I'm like, ah, oh, if I just push one more time, okay. even though it hurts and your skin is so damaged and you're like, I feel like I'm a jerk. You know, you want to pick up the phone and you're like, I just really don't like that cover. 
but I only pushed back nine times, and I wouldn't. I I could guess, but I, I feel like there was a better cover out there. Mm. Having said that, the book sold two hundred thousand copies, that one particularly, so it's okay. But you have to love it. It's your name on the cover. The channel. The answer to your question is: Does it pass the death? Does it pass the deathbed test? Okay. When I'm on my deathbed You're and I look back on my face? book, <laughs> will I have been proud of the book I made? That's yeah. all that really matters at the end of the day. Yeah. Will you have been proud of your piece of art or your contribution to the world when you're at the end of your life? And fight for it. Fight for it. Love it. One last example on this exact thing. Um, I signed a children's book deal. I won't say the name of the publisher, just to, just to keep it confidential. And silly me, it just said, Neil Pastoricha, Book of Awesome, children's book. Signed the contract, got my money, all happy. A couple months later, I'm like, okay, I got my idea. It's gonna be an interactive, hyper-realistic guided meditation. And they're like, what are you talking about? It's gonna be uh, crossword puzzles, stickers. Oh, wow. $6.99. You know, we're printing it around the world. It'll be dirt cheap. We don't even need you, really. We're just gonna use the logo and make it kind of simple. I'm like, no, I want, I want something totally different. Called my literary agent. She's like, well, you can break the book deal, but you'll probably break your relationship with the publisher, too. Mm. And I had a choice to make. At that point, I had some success. So I broke the deal. Hmm. And then I put the concept together for this on a piece of paper, like a Word document, what I wanted. We shopped it again, found a new publisher who liked it, and the book came out. Right. That's the, that's the story of it won at the end. Right. But I could have easily broke the deal and never found anyone again, and then I just don't have a book. So you have to decide. It comes down to your own principles and your own integrity. What do you want? If you're so clear about your vision, it makes it easier for other people to agree with you or for you to say, I'm out. If you're like, I don't really know, then they're then you don't get to decide. Right. You get decided for. And, and props to Penguin. Penguin Publishing came, Penguin came through. For, for yeah. signing up for the guided <laughs> meditation. <laughs> exactly. They Love took it. a risk. Yeah. They took a risk. Cool. So once again, this is a 10-part series with Neil Pasricha on how to get 1 million plus book sales. Coming up next is episode 5 on how to find the perfect title. Go watch the video right there. Continue to believe. And we'll see you there.